Hi, so I'm not like the others. I'm not an internist. I'm not a hematologist. I'm an obstetrician gynecologist. So be careful what you ask me. Uh, uh, but I am going to talk about women and blood clots because I do care for women. How many of you are a woman? <laughs> How many of you have a daughter or a sister whom? Uh, well, why, why talk about women uh, and their unique issues? Are women more likely to have blood clots? In fact, not. We heard from Dr. Ansel that men, in fact, are more likely to have blood clots. We saw those two curves that he presented in one of his slides. Then why single women out? Well, I think we've gotten the picture. Women have some unique challenges. We heard some stories about pregnancy. We heard some stories about birth control pills. And maybe if we heard from one more patient, we would have heard some unique situations about hormone replacement therapy. So there's some circumstances and some life challenges that affect women that are unique around hormones and pregnancy that increase the risk of blood clots. So we'll ask uh, three questions and we'll respond to them. Does pregnancy cause blood clots? Do birth control pills cause blood clots? Does hormone replacement cause blood clots? And how do we respond to those three situations? Well, does pregnancy cause blood clots? Well, one to two per thousand women have blood clots with pregnancy. And the risk of clots increases fourfold during pregnancy. So it's a risk factor, but not necessarily a cause. Uh, the risk of clots increases 20, at least 20-fold after delivery, maybe up to 80-fold. And in that first week after delivery, the risk is up to 100-fold. And this tendency to form clots is actually protection against hemorrhage. So why are women more likely to clot? Well, women have evolved so that they are have some inherent protection against blood clots that protects them at the time of childbirth. And this inherent protection actually forms during pregnancy as early as the first six to eight weeks after pregnancy in case they would miscarry. So there's this inherent response in women uh, probably due to clotting factor proteins that protects them from the bleeding challenges of miscarriage and childbirth. Now, birth control pills, uh, patches, rings, and the hormonal contraceptives that we use are manufactured from hormones that are pregnancy hormones. They are used to make the body think it's a little bit pregnant. And, and as a consequence, it, we can use that to prevent pregnancy but they also carry the side effect of an increased tendency to form clots. So where do these blood clots occur? Well, unlike in older individuals where most of the blood clots occur in arteries, in young people who have healthy arteries, 80% of these blood clots occur in veins. And we heard that blood clots in veins can travel to the lung. 75% of the blood clots that occur in young, healthy women of childbearing age, whether that's in pregnancy or outside of pregnancy, occur in the deep veins. And 25% travel to the lungs. So if a woman has had a blood clot before, and wants to become pregnant or becomes pregnant, those women have a one to 2% risk of having a blood clot each year, but that risk increases to five to 10% during pregnancy if they're untreated, but if they use anticoagulation, they can knock that risk down to 1% and they can equalize their risk to the risk that they had uh, before they became pregnant. So they may have come off of blood thinners uh, after they had a clot, maybe in, because they were used in association with birth control pills or some other circumstance, but now that they want to become pregnant, they're at an increased risk. So how do they compensate for that? Well, 
they need to go back on blood thinners. Thrombophilia, or an increased tendency to form clots, uh, can be either inherited or acquired. We heard terms like the factor V Leiden today. We heard terms like the factor II mutation or prothrombin gene mutation. Those are inherited tendencies to form clots. And on our last panel, we heard two speakers had the anaphospholipid syndrome. That's an acquired tendency to form clots. Uh, it makes very little difference sort of how it came to being because the end result is a tendency to form clots and that tendency needs to be dealt with. So uh, who needs anticoagulation during pregnancy? Well, uh, women whose risk of clots is more than the risk of bleeding with anticoagulants and that anticoagulants are not a free ride. We heard about the increased risk of bleeding with anticoagulants and it's about one to two percent uh, with pregnancy. So we also want any woman who's already on anticoagulants to stay on anticoagulants. So one of, uh, one of the things that we see in our clinic is women are here through the media that any medication is bad through preg in pregnancy. So one of the first things they do when they become pregnant, even if they're on a life-saving blood thinner, is to stop their medication, stop all their medication, and that may include blood thinners. Well, maybe that's not a bad idea if it's warfarin because, as we'll talk about later, warfarin's not good for pregnancy, but they do need to be on some protection against um, blood clots. Other women who need to be on anticoagulation are most women who have had a blood clot in the past but are not currently on anticoagulants. And women with thrombophilia, like the anaphospholipid syndrome, or maybe some inherited thrombophilias who have had a clot in the past or have had bad pregnancy outcomes like recurrent miscarriages or a stillbirth. I alluded to the fact that maybe it's not a bad idea if they come off of warfarin. Well, why is warfarin unsafe during pregnancy? It's a small molecule and it can cross the placenta into the fetal circulation. And warfarin increases the risk of birth defects and even after that critical period where the baby is formed in the first trimester of pregnancy, it can cause bleeding in the fetus and uh, so it is contraindicated is the medical term we use during pregnancy. Even the new oral anticoagulants, which may not carry the same risk, are still small molecules and we do not use them in pregnancy. But heparins, which unfortunately have to be injected, either the intravenous or unfractionated heparin, the standard heparin, or the low molecular weight heparins like anoxaparin, uh, which is the uh, generic form of Lovenox, are large molecules. They do not cross the placenta, and we can use heparin safely in pregnancy. Not only do they not cross the placenta, and can we, we can use them safely to treat the mother, but they probably use reduce the uh, risk of bad outcomes. We have plenty of data to that effect. By improving the maternal circulation to the placenta and improving blood flow to the baby. 